that are so important that the vast majority of people, including Republicans who are asked about it, say, Congress, keep your hands off these rules because you know what? We think they're working. I thank you very much. I would reserve the balance for other speakers. Thank you very much. I yield the floor. Senator from Utah. Mr. President, uh, let us be clear about what the Democrats Rebuild America Jobs Back Act is and what it is not about. It is about expanding infrastructure spending financed by tax increases. It is about setting up a brand new government bureaucracy in the form of an infrastructure bank that will take years to get underway and will subject taxpayers once again to private sector risk taking and to bailouts. It is about following in the footsteps of the ongoing costly government sponsored enterprises or GSEs called Fannie and Freddie. It is about increasing the federal footprint in the infrastructure arena. It is about increasing taxes on those with incomes above $500,000, now creatively called millionaires, including incomes of many business owners who risk their own capital to create jobs. It is about further federal wage controls on construction projects, which lead to inefficient, uh, inefficient use of taxpayer funds. And it is about creating political talking points for the upcoming presidential election. They know their bill is doomed to fail. It's all a game. Now here's what the legislation is not about. It is not about creating jobs. It is not about engineering a more efficient and a more fair tax code. No, this is the same tune, different song, a bill for more spending financed with new taxes. It remains baffling to me that this is all that the other side ever seems to have to offer. The Democrats' proposal incorporates more spending on various infrastructure initiatives including one of, President, uh, of the President's favorites, high-speed rail. As columnist Robert Samuelson wrote in the Washington Post in February this year, quote, high-speed rail is not an investment in the future. It's mostly a waste of money, unquote. As for the arguments by some that we risk losing our global competitive edge without things like high-speed rail, I would encourage them to pay attention to what is going on beyond our shores. China, facing safety concerns, high debt associated with high-speed rail, and political scandals involving kickbacks and undue influence on rail spending has scaled, back its, its plans, uh, <clears throat> has scaled its plans back and operates, operates some high-speed rail at 30 miles per hour. Spain, a one-time darling of those who promote high-speed rail spending, is also scaling back, having identified such spending as imprudent in the current economic environment. Here at home, states have rejected high-speed rail initiatives, and we just learned in recent days that California's bullet train is now projected to cost close to $100 billion, nearly twice its previous projection. Nonetheless, the administration and my friends on the other side of the aisle wish to plow forward by shoveling more taxpayer funds into exactly those sorts of projects with little more than rosy projections of future costs and benefits to justify the expense. Mr. President, I'm deeply skeptical that the Democrats' legislation to fund more infrastructure projects is a good way to address our current national unemployment emergency and need for jobs. According to CPO, quote, large-scale construction projects of any type require years of planning and preparation. Even those that are on the shelf, in quotes, generally cannot be undertaken quickly enough to provide timely stimulus to the economy, unquote. And more often than not, the delays are because of burdensome and inefficient regulatory red tape. As President Obama discovered too late, shovel-ready ready projects are hard to find. In June, he joked about his first stimulus, saying that, quote, shovel-ready was not as shovel-ready as we had expected, unquote. Well, that may have been humorous, except they should have known better. Unfortunately, Americans looking for jobs and the American taxpayers who are now on the hook to pay off President Obama's stimulus driven debt, do not find this to be a laughing matter. The infrastructure bank proposed by the other side would not even be up and running for well over a year, and probably longer. It will take a year or more just to set the bureaucracy up. How can this possibly have anything to do with creating jobs and lowering unemployment today? 
There were some details about the proposed new government infrastructure bank bureaucracy and the power that it will wield. The proposed bank's board is required to give, quote, adequate consideration, unquote, whatever that means, to a host of features including, quote, whether there is sufficient state or municipal political support for the successful completion of the infrastructure project, unquote. Now, while proponents of the infrastructure bank are selling it as, new polit as a new politics-free way to fund projects, even the authorizing legislation explicitly calls for political considerations. The Democrats' bill also claims that the bank would be a, quote, United States government-owned independent, unquote, institution. Government-owned and controlled by political appointees, but somehow independent, just like a GSE, government-sponsored entity. The definition of eligible infrastructure project, in quotes, in their bill includes a wide range of possible projects, including high-speed rail, which Americans do not want or need, and solid waste disposal facilities, like the one that drove Hamsburg, Pennsylvania, into bankruptcy. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, excuse me, into bankruptcy. Most worrisome, the infrastructure bank board, provided by their bill, is provided with the authority to make any modifications it would like at its discretion to what constitutes an eligible infrastructure project. How long do you think it would take for the board to start doling out taxpayer funds to non-viable projects? Haven't we seen enough of that in this administration? Proponents of the infrastructure bank make the peculiar argument that somehow, because the bank would not be able to make grants, taxpayers face no risk of losses. Yet the bank is empowered to make loans, which are risky, and the bank is empowered to issue loan guarantees, just like taxpayer-backed government guarantees of Fannie and Freddie. Uh, uh, really, stop and think about it. This just looks like a rebirth of Fannie and Freddie. That's all we need. Now, how is that not risky? Also problematic is direct Authorization in the Democrats' proposed infrastructure bank for deferral of payments of direct loans in the event that, quote, the infrastructure project is unable to generate sufficient revenues to pay the scheduled loan payments of principal and interest on the direct loan under this act, unquote. Translation, if a project's revenue streams are insufficient to pay off the government loan, then the loan gets modified and extended. This, of course, benefits any private partner of the taxpayer-funded infrastructure project while taxpayers are put on the hook for the losses. Have we been here before? <laughs> we all know what the answer to that is. This is an explicit admission in the authorizing legislation that contingencies are expected in which taxpayers suffer losses and end up bailing out private entities. This is the essence of the corporate bailout. This is corporatism at its worst, privatized profits and socialized losses. The whipsawing here is too much to handle. On one hand, the president, a former community organizer, stands with the Occupy Wall Street protesters, criticizing the so-called rich. On the other hand, he and his congressional allies support legislation that would make taxpayers responsible for the bad decisions of wealthy contractors. I look forward to the critiques of this crony capitalism at the Occupy Wall Street gatherings. And taxpayers are on the hook for billions. Keep in mind that it is not merely the advertised initial price tag of $10 billion of taxpayer money necessary to start up the proposed new infrastructure bank bureaucracy that would be at stake. The bank will be empowered to, quote, leverage, unquote, taxpayer dollars to support 10, 20, or maybe 30 times that amount for so-called private-public partnership projects. Have we already forgotten that leverage is what helped create the largest financial crisis since the Great Depression? Yet amazingly, for proponents of the infrastructure bank, leverage in this case is a good thing. Make no mistake, leverage means risk, and more leverage means ro more risk. Why, when taxpayers have not even seen the last of the losses from Fannie and Freddie, would we even considering, 
consider setting up a brand new public-private mongrel called an infrastructure bank that will again subject taxpayers to losses. Why would we set up a new federal bureaucracy that will require bailouts on projects specially selected by unelected political appointees with the power to pick winners and losers or winning and lo losing projects eligible for government assistance? It is of interest that one of the new pitches for an infrastructure bank is that we need it to help us more, to be more globally competitive. Sometimes comparisons are made with the growth of infrastructure spending in developing countries like China. But of course, developing countries devote many resources to infrastructure spending. It is almost a tautology. Those countries are starting with a much smaller beginning base, so you would expect a need for greater growth. Proponents of infrastructure spending cite rankings of the U.S. globally on its infrastructure from a recent World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report. If they had read the most recent report carefully, they would note that it identifies that the top two most problematic factors for doing business in America are tax rates and inefficient government bureaucracy. Yet the Democrats' bill seeks to increase tax rates and construct a new bureaucracy called an infrastructure bank. Mr. President, we do not need a new federal bureaucracy filled with politically appointed bureaucrats. We do not need a government picking economic winners and losers. We do not need more government spending years from now to deal with an unemployment crisis today. We do not need more taxes at a time when the unemployment rate is stuck at 9.1 percent. And we most definitely do not need another GSE. But I can tell you, if you like Fannie and Freddie, you will love the proposed infrastructure bank. Once again, the other side has turned to divisiveness and class warfare. Evil millionaires and billionaires, who Democrats now define as an individual with income starting at $500,000, need to be brought to economic justice. A 0.7 percent tax, or whatever the rate of the week special cooked up by the Democratic War Room happens to be, imposed on individual income that begins at $500,000 will bring equality and justice for all. A few points need to be made about the surtax proposal. First, it is more taxes to pay for more government spending. We need to keep in mind when we hear Democrats talk about the need to raise taxes to reduce the deficit. Second, it is not real economic or tax policy. It is designed to deliver a talking point to an administration increasingly concerned about its re-election uh, prospects. Mr. President, I remind my friends on the other side of the aisle again that those earning 500000 or more who, who, creatively, who they creatively call millionaires and billionaires are not a static group of people. Many who earn those amounts in one year are likely to earn far less in the next year or in the prior year. In fact, the highest income taxpayers are a dynamic and rapidly changing group. Any one of us could become there if we just work hard enough and and, and, and are smart enough to get there. And that's constantly changing. And keep in mind that a significant number of people hit by the Democrats' tax hike would be business owners, the same people we need to create new jobs. Significant fractions of net positive business income and of active flow through business income would be subject to Senator Reid's new surtax. This is especially harmful to small businesses which are often organized as flow-through entities, including sole proprietorships, partnerships, LLCs, and S-corporations. Mr. President, we do not need higher taxes that will fail on job creators to write checks for the President's special preferences, like spending on high-speed rail that Americans do not want or need. We do not need a risky GSE-like taxpayer-funded infrastructure bank populated by political appointees able to pick and choose whatever spending they like to define as an infrastructure project while subjecting taxpayers to private risk-taking. Fortunately, there is a better way, and it is contained in, in my legislation titled the Long-Term Surface Transportation Ex Extension Act of 2011. Briefly, here's what it does. It eliminates dedicated funding for transportation enhancements and gives states the authority to decide whether to spend re resources on add-ons such as bike paths. It reforms the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, by eliminating inefficient bureaucratic red tape and accelerating project delivery and contracting, just as called for by the President's Job Council. 
It supports job creation by placing a temporary timeout on job-killing regulations that are estimated to have significant economic effects. It includes provisions for waivers of inefficient environmental reviews, approvals, and licensing, and permitting requirements for road, highway, and bridge rebuilding efforts in emergency situations. These things cost billions of unnecessary dollars. It goes straight to the matter of job creation, and it draws from bipartisan recommendations, including recommendations from the President's own Bipartisan Jobs Council. We haven't ignored the President. We're taking some of his ideas and putting them in this bill. It allows fully paid for infrastructure projects to be undertaken to help build roads, bridges, and a host of other projects without imposing permanent job-killing higher taxes during our national unemployment emergency. Mr. President, I urge all of my colleagues to vote in support of my leg legislation and to vote against the tax and spend alternative offered by those on the other side. We've had enough of this. We've had enough with Fannie and Freddie. Yes, it was set up to do good, but it's wound up putting some bankruptcy, and then just this week we find that they've all, uh, that many of the leaders, Fannie and Freddie, are taking home huge bonuses for running a place into the ground. Now, the new ones, I think, uh, the new leadership, uh, maybe that's a little harsh, but the fact of the matter is, why should they be taking bonuses when we know that Fannie and Freddie are in real trouble? And I predict that if the Democrat bill passes and we get this infrastructure bank set up, it's only a matter of time till this will be another Fannie and Freddie. That's what happens when government bureaucrats decide who wins, who loses, and interfere with the private sector. And those who have always made the private sector go and be efficient and worthwhile for all of us. Mr. President, uh, I yield the floor. President. Senator from Delaware. Uh, I ask uh, for unanimous consent to speak uh, for five minutes. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, last uh, year I was pleased to provide the other president, the President of the United States, with the names of three superbly qualified Delawareans for him to consider for the uh, one open seat on the U.S. District Court in Delaware. There are four, uh, four seats in that court. Any one of those uh, three individuals would have made an excellent addition to our court, and all of them uphold a high regard in which that court is held, and not only in Delaware, but across our country. I believe the President has made three, uh, made a particularly strong choice in nominating for this vacancy Richard G. Andrews for this judicial appointment this past May. The Senate Judiciary Committee used sound judgment in approving this nomination unanimously in September. And we're grateful for the expeditious handling and approval of this nomination unanimously. When I travel across Delaware, I often hear from people who are convinced that the uh, Senate is overwhelmed by partisan tensions, which really, in too many instances, leave us incapable of doing our jobs. I'm sure that my colleagues, both Republicans and Democrats here today, have heard similar concerns. Confirming Rich Andrews will help to win back some confidence, I think, that we can work together here to do the right thing, not just for the people of Delaware, but for the people of America. Throughout his career, Rich Andrews has been supported by members of both parties. He was appointed the United States uh, uh, Attorney under Attorney General Janet Reno and Attorney General John Ashcroft, both of them, one a Democrat, the other a Republican. Most recently, the Senate Judiciary Committee supported his nomination without one single dissent. Our country is fortunate that someone with his outstanding credentials has stepped forward to do this critical work. Mr. Andrews' education, his background, his legal experience make him superbly qualified for this position. As a student at Haverford College, Rich Andrews graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science, after which he earned his law degree at the University of California in Berkeley, where he served as noted comment editor for the California Law Review. After law school, Rich Andrews launched his career as a clerk for the Honorable Colin J. Seitz, legendary chief judge of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Following his clerkship for 23 years, Rich served as a prosecutor in the United States Attorney's Office in Wilmington, serving in a number of high-profile positions and eventually rising to the position of assistant U.S. attorney. When duty called, he stepped up to serve as acting U.S. Attorney not once, not twice, but on three separate occasions. I've kidded him to say he served longer as acting U.S. Attorney than some people have served as U.S. Attorney in other states. 
But during his time with the U.S. Attorney's Office, Rich prepared and prosecuted countless federal cases and in doing so gained wide-ranging trial experience that he will draw upon heavily while serving as a district court judge if confirmed today. Currently, Rich serves as a state prosecutor for the Delaware Department of Justice, where he manages the criminal division overseeing more than 70 deputy attorney generals and making critical decisions about how to proceed in high-level criminal cases. Finally, in addition to his professional experience, Rich is a family man, a person of great character. His wife, Kathy Langto, is the associate dean and a professor of law at Villanova University. Their son, Peter, is a sophomore at Columbia University, and their daughter, Amy, is a senior and student council president at Mount Pleasant High School, not far from where my family and I live. In his uh, free time, Rich has coached for the Concord Soccer Association of Delaware for more than a decade, and I understand that Rich has also spent parts of the last four years grading answers for the Delaware Bar Exam. In every facet of his life, Rich Andrews has performed with distinction. And let me conclude by saying that I'm proud to support someone who has provided and who will continue to provide exemplary service for the people of our state and nation. His sound legal judgment, his tireless work ethic, and his experience as a federal prosecutor have prepared Rich Andrews well to fill this seat on the U.S. District Court in Delaware. And I urge my colleagues to support me in joining in support of this confirmation. With that, I yield back the floor, and thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President. Senator from Minnesota. Uh, Mr. President, I'm speaking on the vote that is about to occur in this chamber on the Rebuild America Jobs Act. Over the past few days, we have been discussing how to best address our nation's crumbling infrastructure. The cracks in this broken system became tragically clear on a beautiful summer's day in Minnesota, August 1, 2007, when the I-35W bridge simply crashed into the Mississippi River, killing 13 people, dozens of cars in the river. As I said that day, a bridge just shouldn't fall down in the middle of America, but it did. And not an eight-lane highway shouldn't fall down, not a highway that is literally six blocks from my house that I drive over every day with my family, but that's what happened. And yet four years after the I-35W bridge collapsed and was fixed a year later, Still, 25% of the nation's 600,000 bridges have been declared structurally deficient or obsolete. 25%. Our country has gotten a near failing grade from the Civil Academy of Engineers. Our construction workers have an unemployment rate uh, that is over 13%, more than four points above the national average. These are not acceptable realities in this country. Americans spend four point eight billion hours every year stuck in congestion, stuck in traffic. And when you look at what happens in other countries, other countries that are spending seven, eight, nine percent of their gross national product on infrastructure, we're at barely hanging in at two percent. Yet we want to be a competitive nation. We want to be a nation that makes things again, that exports to the world. Well, if we don't have the air traffic control system that works, if we don't have the bridges that work, if we don't have the highways that work, if we don't have a way of waterways to bring our barges down, to bring our goods to market, we are not going to be able to compete in this economy. This is simply not an acceptable reality for a country like America. You think about the interstate highway system built during Eisenhower's presidency with the Democratic Congress. Uh, you think about rural electrification, all of these things that were built during difficult times in this country. Why? Because we didn't think America was about just tinkering at the edges. We believed that America was about moving ahead. That's why we need to move forward today on the Rebuild America Jobs Act. All of us recognize the urgent need for new and bold initiatives to fix what is broken and to build the roads, the bridges, the airports, and the ports we need to fuel a 21st century economy. And the Infrastructure Bank, which is of course included in this legislation, uh, is something that has enjoyed bipartisan support from the beginning. It's one of those initiatives that will foster public-private partnership with the potential to leverage hundreds of billions of dollars for infrastructure investment. It's about big projects, but it's also about rural projects in states like Vermont and Minnesota. It's about wastewater treatment plants and water projects and sewer projects, things that have been neglected for way too long. 
Fixing our nation's infrastructure will provide a broad range of benefits. We can reduce that congestion, we can better compete globally, we can create jobs and improve public safety. This is about working to ensure that no bridge ever again collapses in the middle of America. This is our challenge. We can't put it off any longer. This is the time to act. Traditionally, there have been no such thing as a Democratic bridge or a Republican bridge. In fact, the Transportation Secretary for President Obama is a former Republican congressman. We have come together on infrastructure. We cannot come apart. This is the time to come together. I urge my colleagues to vote to allow this bill to proceed to a vote. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to yield back all the time on both sides, and I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a second? There appears to be. Uh, the question is on the motion to proceed to S-1769. Under the previous order, 60 votes are required to adopt the motion. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte, Mr. Brasso, Mr. Baucus. Mr. Beckage, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, Mr. Brown of Ohio, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Conrad, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Dement, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Franken. Aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heller, Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hutchison, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Noway, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Carey, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Kyle, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Lieberman, Mr. Luger, Mr. Manchin, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson of Nebraska, Mr. Nelson of Florida, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schumer, Thank you, sir. 
This is Shaheen. Mr. Shelby. Miss Snow. Miss Davenow. Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Mr. Webb, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker. No. Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative. Baucus, Beckage, Cardin, Casey, Conrad, Franken, Harkin, Klobuchar, Levin, Menendez, Merkley, Murray, Rockefeller, Sanders, Stabenow, and Warner. Senators voting in the negative. Corker, Grassley, Isaacson, Luger, and Wicker. Mr. Carey, aye. Mr. Brown of Ohio, aye. Mr. Cochran, no. Mrs. McCaskill, aye. Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, no. Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, aye. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, aye. Mr. Hatch, no. Mrs. Boxer, aye.
Mr. Cornyn, no. Mr. Bennett, aye. Mr. Pryor, aye. Mr. Johans, no. Ms. Mikulski, aye. Mr. Inhofe, no. Mr. Reed of Nevada, aye. Mr. Sessions, no. Mr. Bingaman, aye. Mr. Lautenberg, aye. Mr. Coates, no. Mr. Roberts, Mr. Roberts, no. Mr. Vitter, Mr. Vitter, no. Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, no. Mr. Leahy, aye. Ms. Cantwell, aye. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Durbin, aye. Mr. Crapo, no. Mr. Moran, no. Mr. Moran, no. Mr. Heller, Mr. Heller, no. 
Mr. Manchin, aye. Mr. Alexander. Mr. Alexander, no. Mrs. Hagan. Mrs. Hagan, aye. Mr. Burr? Mr. Burr? No. Mr. McCain? Mr. McCain? No. statute does not address Mr. Paul? No. Mr. Nelson, Nebraska, no. Mr. Udall, New Mexico, aye. Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, no. Mr. Wyden, Mr. Wyden, aye. Mr. No Way, Mr. No Way, aye. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, no. Mr. Lee, no. Mr. Kirk, no. Ms. Ayotte, no. Mr. Shelby, no. Mrs. Hutchison, Mrs. Hutchison, no. Mr. Lieberman, Mr. Lieberman, no. Ms. Snow, Ms. Snow, no. Mr. Schumer, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Ms. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, no. Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, no. Mr. Brasso, Mr. Brasso, no. Webb. Mr. Webb, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham, no. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Bozeman, no. Mr. Akaka, aye. Mr. Carper. Mr. Carper, aye. Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, aye.
Mr. Coburn, no. Mr. Udall of Colorado, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Tester, aye. Mr. Dement, no. Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Blumenthal, aye. Mr. Chambliss, no. Yep. <laughs> Mr. Nelson of Florida, aye. Ms. Landrew, aye. Mr. Enzi, no. Mr. Hoven, no. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, no. Mr. Kyle, Mr. Kyle, no. Mr. Toomey, no. Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mr. Rish, no. Mr. Portman, no.
On this vote, the yeas are 51, the nays are 49. Under the previous order requiring 60 votes for the adoption of this motion, the motion to proceed is not agreed to. Majority Leader. Senator, it will be in order. Would you like to outline what the rest of the day will be? Oh. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that notwithstanding the previous order, following the next vote, the Senate proceed to executive session to consider the following nominations. Calendar number 353 and 356. There will be two minutes for debate equally divided in the usual form following that debate of calendar number 356. I'm sorry, following that debate, calendar number 3. 356 be confirmed. The Senate proceed to vote with no order in action or debate on calendar number 353 with provision of the previous order remaining in effect and that the next two votes be 10 minutes in duration. Without objection. The question is on the motion to proceed to S1786 under the previous order. 60 votes are required to adopt this motion. Equally divided on the debate. Who yields? Who yields back? Who yields time? Two minutes equally divided. One minute. It's too okay. Madam President. Senator from California. Order in the Senate, please. Please take your conversations out of the well. The Senate is not in order. Please take your conversations out of the well. Senator from California. Thank you very much. Colleagues, what's before us now is supposed to be a jobs bill. Actually, all they do here in this alternative, my Republican friends, is they extend the highway trust fund at the current levels. So that is something we intend to do, and uh, Senator Inhofe and I are going to bring a bill to the floor that does that. But they decide that they want to do it now, and how do they pay for it? They cut $40 billion out of such functions as firefighters, police, border patrol, food safety inspectors, and we will lose 200,000 jobs from that action. In addition, there are two rollbacks of environmental laws that deserve a heck of a lot more notice than putting them in this bill. And that's going to hurt our people, because if you can't breathe, you can't work. And we've got to get the mercury and the soot and the arsenic out of the air. So I hope we'll vote no on this. It's not a jobs bill. I would yield. Time. Time is yielded back. Is there a sufficient second? There is a sufficient second. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Ayotte. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Baucus. Mr. Begich. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman. Mrs. Boxer. <laughs> Mr. Brown of Massachusetts. Mr. Brown of Ohio. 
Mr. Burr. Ms. Cantwell. I have to answer this. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates. Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins. Mr. Conrad. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Dement. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Inzi. Mrs. Feinstein. Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley. Mrs. Hagen. Mr. Harkin. Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heller, Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hutchison, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inoue. Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota. Mr. Carey. Mr. Kirk. Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Kyle, Ms. Landrieu. Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee. Mr. Levin. Mr. Lieberman. I did. I got you. Mr. Luger. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Manchin, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill. Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez. <laughs> Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson of Nebraska, Mr. Nelson of Florida, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Sessions, Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Snow, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner,
Mr. Webb. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative. Alexander, Ayotte, Barrasso, Lunt, Bozeman, Brown of Massachusetts, Burr, Chambliss, Coates, Coburn, Cochran, Corker, Cornyn, Crapo, Dement, Enzi, Graham, Grassley, Hatch, Heller, Hutchison, Inhofe, Isaacson, Johans, Johnson of Wisconsin, Kirk, Kyle, Lee, Manchin, McCain, McConnell, Moran, Paul, Portman, Rish, Roberts, Rubio, Sessions, Shelby, Thune, Toomey, Vitter, and Wicker. Senators voting in the negative. Akaka, Baucus, Bennett, Bingaman, Blumenthal, Boxer, Carden, Carper, Casey, Conrad, Durbin, Feinstein, Franken, Gillibrand, Johnson of South Dakota, Carey, Klobuchar, Cole, Lautenberg, Leahy, McCaskill, Menendez, Merkley, Murray, Nelson of Nebraska, Nelson of Florida, Pryor, Reed of Rhode Island, Reed of Nevada, Rockefeller, Sanders, Schumer, Tester, Udall of Colorado, Warner, and Wyden. Mrs. Shaheen, no. Ms. Snow, Ms. Snow, no. Mr. Luger, Mr. Luger, I, Ms. Stabenow. Ms. Stabenow, no. Mr. Lieberman. Mr. Lieberman, no. Ms. Cantwell, no. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, no. Mr. Webb. Mr. Webb, no. Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, no. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown of Ohio, no. Mr. Harkin, Mr. Harkin, no. Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mrs. Hagan, Mrs. Hagan, no. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Whitehouse, no. Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins, aye. Ms. Landrew, no. Mr. Begich, no. Ms. Mikulski. Ms. Mikulski, no.
Mr. Inouye, no. Mr. Levin. Mr. Levin, no. Mr. Hoven, I. Any senators in the chamber wishing to change their vote? On this vote, the yeas are 47, the nays are 53. Under the previous order requiring 60 votes for the adoption of this motion, the motion to proceed is not agreed to. Under the previous order, the Senate having received from the House a message with respect to H.R. 2112, the Senate insists on its amendments, agrees to a conference with the House, and the chair appoints the following as conferees on the part of the Senate.